Please welcome Jeff Abels. Okay, thank you. So um, thank you and welcome to creating a people-centric digital workplace. So to talk about people-centric digital workplace, we have to go back to the very beginning of the digital workplace, which goes back a little further than you may think, all the way back to the year 1840. Now in the 1840s, the Industrial Revolution was already well underway, right? Fired by coal and steam power, and uh, mass production and manufacturing, jobs were flocking to urban centers around the globe, and particularly in the United States, which was a developing country at that point. Now, there were two cities at that time that had very different uh, levels of development. The first was Baltimore, Maryland. How many of you are from Baltimore, Maryland? A few, awesome. Uh, the second was Chicago. Any people from Chicago here today? A few more, all right, welcome. So Baltimore, Maryland, was uh, the second largest city in the United States of America at that time. So it was like a shining future city. It's sitting in a port city and it's 1840 in a country that has uh, a bright future ahead of it with lots of expansion going on. Baltimore thought its course was set. Chicago, by contrast, was a small podunk frontier town, about 5,000 people in it. It was close to number 200 in terms of city size in the country at that time. But Chicago did something crazy. They looked and said, what's going on in our urban centers right now? And what was going on actually wasn't pretty. Jobs were going on, and people came because there was so much opportunity there. But what was also going on was exploding population growth. And the cities could not keep up with it. Sanitation standards were extremely low. Infant mortality rates were high. Disease was running rampant. People were dissatisfied. There was a lot of social unrest going on. And cities were saying, look, we need to keep growing. We know that these urban centers are gonna keep getting bigger and bigger, but we need to do something about this. So Chicago, little podunk town, was the first city in the country to make a major investment in a comprehensive sewage system, a place, a way to clean up what was going on, to provide running water, to dispose of waste. And it looked crazy by those days' standards. Why would little teeny Chicago make this investment? But Chicago was poised to explode in growth. By making this infrastructure investment, they actually put a foundation, almost literally, under their city that enabled them to grow and grow and grow. Baltimore, Maryland, by contrast, said, we're huge. We don't need to make this investment. We're already number two, and we're just going to keep growing. We don't need to refit our foundation, and frankly, we have so much infrastructure already, the time and expense of doing this, it's going to be cost prohibitive. So, so Baltimore, Maryland, by contrast, it was actually the last city in this country to make an investment in a comprehensive sewage system. And you can see the growth rates behind me speak for themselves. Chicago overtook Baltimore as number two within just a few decades of making that investment. And their growth rate was explosive. Baltimore, Maryland, by contrast, was somewhat flat. And the interesting thing is, I gave the same uh, story to another group just a few weeks ago, and one of the individuals in the audience actually works in the Baltimore, Maryland sewage system uh, today, and pulled me aside and said, you know what, not only will we last, but we always cobbled it together. It's still a mess right now. We're trying to figure out how to make it work. One person gets no bills for three years, then they get a bill for $10,000. We, we're, we're trying to kind of keep all this cobbled together. Does that feel like any of your businesses today? Like you're sitting on top of a foundation and you're just putting little bits and pieces out there trying to become more digital oriented? Well, what Baltimore, Maryland learned was this, right? In a very real sense, like if we're not paying attention to our people, what's going to happen? So I already got a great introduction. You heard all the boring stuff about me. Let me give you a little bit of the personal stuff about me. Um, my wife and I are recent empty nesters. So in addition to my passion for helping businesses be more customer and employee engaged, whether that's at a digital level or at a human level, um, our passions are also around spending time with our kids and our sons-in-law uh, now. In fact, I'm so new to this, I was calling them stepsons for a while and they had to correct me. <laughs> we also love riding a motorcycle together and just touring wherever we can, going on charity rides, that kind of stuff. And we also have just fallen in love with wine. We love really good wines. Now, we try not to enjoy both of those passions at the same time. So if you want to get together and chat about any of those things, I would love to do that. 
So what is the new infrastructure? What is the new foundation? If you asked CEOs just a couple of years ago now, uh, what they would have said is digital is not going to disrupt my business. Look, we, we, the technology boom happened, the internet boom and bust, and then kind of steady growth again happened, and we've survived it. Our business is stable now. We don't need to change that much. The digital thing has done its work. And yet, just a year ago, when they asked those same CEOs the same question, it went from 1% of CEOs saying digital would disrupt to 75% of CEOs saying that digital would disrupt. What happened in the interim? What happened that suddenly made them decide that this was a major disruptive force? You see some ideas on this chart behind me. Some of these things are absolutely disruptive companies that are built on a digital foundation are shaking to the core businesses that people thought had nothing to do with digital. Who would have thought that digital would disrupt the cab industry, the retail food industry, and yet here it is. Some of the things up here are things that companies that have grown fast and have gotten so large and unwieldy, and frankly, they're doing such a poor job of retrofitting digital to themselves, they've created crises. And those crises could have been mitigated through the unbelievably better communications that are available to them through digital workplace tools, but they haven't embraced them correctly yet. So these are the things that organizations have been looking at saying, this is absolutely something that's going to disrupt us and change the future for our organization. Let me just check that mic again. That's still working well? Okay. So let's back that up a little bit and look at it through a historical lens a little more closely. So we talked about the 1840s, but if we really go back and look even further back, there seem to be these trends about every hundred years for the past several hundred years, right? Beginning of the Industrial Revolution, it was kind of sparked with coal and steam back around the 1760s. We got through that and there was a lot of change and that's where our story began in Baltimore and Chicago. But in the 1860s, that's when we saw that explosive growth starting to happen and people that had built a good foundation because electrification came on and raised quality of life, but also raised our standards of being able to produce things at a lower price and all of those things. Then in the 1960s, that's when the computational and communications transformation started to happen, right? So most of us look at that and say that has transformed our society, and now we are here, right? We're at the edge of that trend. So we're at the outside edge of the digital transformation, right? What I think is that it actually looks a little bit different because these things happen every 100 years. We are at the outside of the computational and communications trend but we are only just at the front of the next wave, the wave that's going to be fueled by human-machine interaction, by artificial intelligence, by the Internet of Things, built on the foundation of all these other things that have happened before us. This is a transformative effect we're starting to feel now, and this is what CEOs are starting to look at and say, something new is coming. None of us knows exactly what it's going to look like, but we know it's another transformation that we're going through. And if we didn't build a good foundation with the last transformation, this next one's going to become even more difficult for us. So let's dive into that and take it apart a little bit. Now here's what happens. When you talk about knowledge management and intranets and artificial intelligence and digital transformation, executives see those and go, I want that transformation. Our organization wants to go from the, the slow, slow moving, non, uh, non-agile caterpillar to the beautiful agile butterfly, right? We want to have that agility. We want to go through that transformation. So executives look at it and they say, you know what? Let's go buy technology. Let's push, that's an easy button, right? Let's go buy an intranet system. Let's go buy a knowledge management solution. Let's go get Office 365. Let's go get a CRM solution to make us more customer and people centric. So they push that easy button, right? And oftentimes you guys are the ones who are at the front of that button as it's being pushed and they push it and they push it and they push it again and they're not really getting the results they want and you start to realize that maybe that's not really an easy button <laughs> that they're pushing, right? So, so what's going on here? First of all, we need to know that transformation, it's always an incremental process, right? It's evolutionary, not revolutionary. If you look at revolutions throughout history, a few of them worked out, but frankly, most of them didn't. It's small, incremental, evolutionary steps planned out with a long-term vision. That's what ultimately gets you to where you need to go, particularly if you're an established legacy organization and you can't start with something brand new from the get-go. You need to rethink your, your infrastructure as a part of it. And when we don't do this, 
here is the results of clicking that easy button, right? And we saw some of this uh, this morning. I know one of the speakers talked about big data and said 85% of big data projects look the same as these, right? They're not getting the results that we expect them to get because we think they're an easy button. I buy my big data app and I'm, I'm going to be doing big data, right? And yet we're not really getting the results that we're looking for because there's something more meaningful going on here that we need to figure out. And it's not necessarily about technology, it's actually about people, right? When Chicago made their investment, it wasn't about a sewage infrastructure system, it was about people. It was about looking at it and saying, we are a place that exists to serve people. And so what do we do to serve people? This is what we invest in to serve people. This is how we're gonna be able to be a better place for people to live and get their jobs done. So for us, as we went through this and started to look at it, our history was, um, our story kind of unravels itself as we go through this. So we've been in business for about 16 years. And when we started doing projects, one of the things we thought was we saw some of these failure statistics and we thought, we've got it right because our customers seem to like us. We finish our projects and kind of wave our check and flag and go off to the next project and, and everything seems to be in good shape. And then we started looking in our own rear view mirror. And we didn't like what we were seeing because our success statistics, when we looked at what those clients were now struggling with, it didn't look a whole lot better than what was going on everywhere else in the industry. And it was humbling and sobering for us. And we looked at it and said, do we want to be someone who kind of just does what we're told and, and you know, engages with some companies to do some stuff that we think is good, but it's up to them to get the most out of it? Or do we really introspect? Do we really pause and back up and look at failure and say, what's the difference between the ones who are succeeding and the ones who are struggling. And so that's what we did. And it was really important to look at both of those things. I'll talk about that a little bit more, but you can't just look at success and imitate success. Because frankly, oftentimes, a lot of the things that the successful ones are doing are the same things that the ones who are failing are doing. You need to understand the differences between those. That, by the way, is the heart of artificial intelligence. Looking at these things and saying, how do we learn from our successes? by comparing them to our mistakes and looking at those closely. So we spent a lot of time doing that. And thankfully, we were blessed with many great clients um, and also some non-clients, many businesses we were able to go into and just research and talk to and listen to and say, what's the difference? What I can tell you is we learned five key things I'm going to go through. And what I can tell you about those five key things is this. You will probably think, well, we kind of do that, and we kind of do that on each one of these. I rarely have people come to this and go, oh my gosh, we're missing all five of those things. But the difference is the organizations who take all five very, very seriously, not just a, yeah, I can check that box and say we kind of do that. It's written on our mission statement somewhere maybe, or we got a project that's about that. But it's really at the heart and soul of who you are and what you do, okay? So take them seriously. As you look at it, don't think we do it. Think about where are we missing it? Where have we not embraced this? Because when we look at this closely, Almost every organization has a long way to go in all five of these areas, but there are different places with each of the five. Now, the interesting thing about these five areas is you heard your, uh, the keynote this morning. They align very well with that because they're not really about business things. They're about people things. These five things are at the heart, really, of every human relationship. And businesses that are trying to create a more digital workplace are realizing People and not technology are really what's at the heart of the digital workplace. And the things we've always needed to do to create better relationships, better collaboration that leads to more innovation and productivity, those are still the same things we're doing now. But digital can help us do them at a, at a better pace and at a deeper and broader level than ever before. So let's dive in and talk about the five. The first thing that the most engaged people in the world do is they're phenomenal listeners, right? They listen to other people. No relationship starts by someone showing up and just talking and talking and telling you all about themselves. We've all got friends who do that, right? And they're probably not our closest friends. The closest ones are the ones who say, I'm gonna make an actual habit out of listening to you, asking you questions. And I'm gonna remember what you tell me. I'm gonna listen to you and remember what you tell me. And digital workplaces have said the same thing. You know what we've gotta do? We've gotta to listen to each other, and we've gotta to listen to our customers, and we've gotta remember it. We've got to put it in our corporate memory. We've got to retain that knowledge so that when we have one conversation, it doesn't need to be had again and again and again. We retain that knowledge so we can continue to access that knowledge over time. But there's a problem with that. And that is we put that information into so many systems. Research that we've done tells us that when employees have to go from two enterprise systems 
to three or more enterprise systems to get their jobs done, their satisfaction drops by over 14%. Further research tells us, I think this is research from Microsoft, that the average worker in the United States has to use 25 systems per week to get their jobs done. And that varies by industry, it varies by role, but the reality is we're absolutely fatiguing our folks, right? We talk about that digital disruption, digital disruption isn't that a competitor disrupts us, sometimes it's that we adopt digital technology and it disrupts our ability to keep focus as an organization. People are very frustrated that they have to hop from one system to another to another. They have to learn all sorts of different things just to get their simple job done. Now what's the answer to this? The answer is not to listen in fewer places, right? All these conversations are happening everywhere. And we can't tell our people, well, we're not going to listen on social anymore. Or we're not going to bother even starting to listen on this new developing chatbot channel or something like that. Our customers and our employees want to interact across all of these channels. Probably two more were added to this list since the time I started this, right? You talk about social as a channel. Social is a collection of channels. How many business social channels do you have? I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and someone was talking about, well, we've got Chatter, and we've got Yammer, and we've got Microsoft Teams, and we've got, um, I can't even remember what all of them were, but it was one after another after another. In one organization, they said, we don't know where to go to post some social post because one team uses one thing, one team uses another, and yet we need to be cross-teaming. How do we do all of this together? How do we make all of it work? And there's actually some amazing vendors who talk a little bit about how we can bring all of those things together. Here's a real answer. We need to listen in all of these places. There's going to be more and more ways and places to listen to our people and to the things that support our people, right? In IoT types of applications. What we really need to do is we need to remember in fewer. We need to give place, people fewer places to go to have to access the information they need to get their jobs done. So we're listening in as many places as we can, but the goal is, how do we give people fewer places to go to get their jobs done? How do we do that? What we found are one simple rule, really a set of two rules, I suppose, and that is the, the ones who are really doing well with this are saying, we're going to, number one, integrate, or number two, we're going to migrate and eliminate. So what this does not mean is we're just going to have one system to rule them all, right? We're going to need lots of systems, and you know what? They're going to keep proliferating. There's new ones that are going to come in all the time. When, he, when we integrate, it simply means, okay, this group, this set of users, this team, this is their main system of record. And we're going to integrate other systems with it so that the data they need to get their jobs done is all available to them in this one system. We could talk a lot about what integration means. It can mean different things. But basically, sharing data so people have to go to few, fewer places. The vision, of course, is one system of record for each person in the company. That's never going to be the reality. But that's the nature of a vision. We're always working towards getting closer to that. The other side of this, and this is the harder part to swallow, this is the Baltimore focus to think about, and that is migrate and eliminate. What that means is, what legacy systems do we have that we don't need anymore? And some of those legacy systems aren't that legacy, right? We work with one company, it's like, we just finished a new loyalty system, we paid three and a half million dollars for it, we finished it three years ago, we can't touch that, right? We have to keep that system. When we looked at it, it was very obvious that it was creating a lot of redundant work for people that didn't need to happen. And it was going to be relatively easy to say, we can get rid of it. We can, we can move it into one of your other knowledge management types of tools that you already have with almost no development time uh, and, and make it easier on your users. And so ultimately, they did that. But that is a bitter pill to swallow. You're saying, we've, we've put some infrastructure in place. Now you're saying, pull some of that infrastructure out. I don't know about if this describes many of you, but we do work with some companies who are still saying, we have this green screen AS400 thing, and it's worked for us for many years. And by the way, it went out of support about 15 years ago, but we've got one developer who's 92 years old, and he knows how to keep it running, and so we're not, and, and the CEO doesn't want to spend money on it, so we're not going to do it. Those companies are the ones that aren't going to be here anymore, right? When things don't change, there's a word for that a few years after they stop changing. That word is extinct, right? Cities don't go extinct. Businesses do. People do if skills don't stay up to date. So what does that look like in practical terms? Here's a couple of just quick charts that have been done for some client work we've done. You can see one of these was working on how do we make CRM, the system of record, for some things we're doing. And what was interesting was look at the number of systems. I won't go through all what all the lines mean, but dotted and solid lines mean different things. Look at all the different systems that those users were having to access that were also accessing CRM. 
Now that chart came to be because after they implemented CRM, and this was not a, a, a project we'd work, work on initially, they called us in and said, you know, adoption isn't going well, we're getting lots of complaints, and somebody gave us a great quote from that client. They said, you know what, we felt like our team, that is our, kind of the customer facing team, we work hard, we love this company, we work hard for it, and we felt like we were marching up a hill, taking that hill for leadership again and again, and leadership came with a rock that said CRM on it, and they threw it into our backpack and said, that should help, and they didn't take anything out of the backpack, right? That's what we're doing to our folks. We're adding new systems, we're not taking anything away. We just keep thinking, maybe this next one will fix it, maybe this next one will fix it. The other one is more of a knowledge management, it was more Office 365 oriented, same kind of concept. Looks a little prettier, but if you look closely, you get a sense of all the different applications that those teams are using and how they could be unified in a much smaller number of applications to use. So listening is the first rule of a better people-centric digital uh, workplace. The second rule of great connectors is that they understand, right? You probably all know who Stephen Covey was. One of the many things that Stephen Covey was famous for saying is our problem is not that we don't listen. Our problem is that we listen with the intent to respond rather than with the intent to truly understand, right? We're not slowing down and exploring and really understanding what's going on. And look, we're all familiar with that, aren't we? We know what it's like to be on the giving and receiving end of that. I know, I catch myself regularly thinking, look, I look like I'm listening to you. Can you shut up so I can tell you what I need to tell you now? Yeah. Am I really understanding? And I know what it's like to be on the receiving end of that too, right? Did that conversation ever really happen? Was there ever any real value in that conversation because we're so interested in just getting our points across that we didn't actually make any good decisions or agree on anything? Probably not. The same thing is true in business. Now, what's the word in business for understanding? It's analytics. It's business intelligence. It's artificial intelligence. It's machine, it's all of those different things, right? It's how do we get inside the heads of people to understand what's going on? And sometimes we lose sight of that, by the way. Sometimes we think analytics is, we take the people out of it, and we forget that behind every little nugget of analytics, there is a human story. Because why does every business exist? It exists to serve a person. It exists to serve people. The people inside the company and the people outside of the company that provide the products and services that exist to serve. Whether you're government, nonprofit, for profit, whatever. Those same basic things are always true. So how important is this idea? How important is it that we really have an analytical understanding of things? Heck, 85% of big data projects fail, so can this really be a game changer? Well, according to this research from IBM, it might be the differentiator between companies that are average and companies that are wildly successful. This comes from research, some research IBM did, a global CEO study. They talked to over 1,200 global CEOs, but before they did it, they took all of those companies and they sorted them in terms of how productive they were in terms of their growth and their profit margins overall. And they took the most profitable and fastest growth, 20%, and said, what makes them different from everyone else? Let me say that again. They did not take the profitable and the unprofitable. They took the wildly successful and everyone else, which includes the successful, marginally successful, and extremely unsuccessful all in that category. And they said, what makes them different? And they found three things that made them different. And that was, the first two, they were 108% better at accessing data and at drawing insights out of the, that data. 108% better for the top 20%, huge margin. The third thing was they're 84% better at taking those insights and translating them into action. That's what analytics is all about. That's this idea of understanding, understanding our customers, understanding our employees, understanding who we are as a company. I tell you, a lot of companies, I think, actually have an identity crisis, trying to figure out exactly who we are and what we're in the business with. You guys might have heard of Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker spent a huge amount of his career helping companies answer three questions. What are we in the business of doing? Who are our customers? And what do they consider to be valuable? Right? Those are the three questions that we need to answer again and again for ourselves because we lose track of them. So when it comes to big data, what's one of the things that's going on with this? You guys know these statistics, right? Data is growing at an ever faster rate. More knowledge, more data exists now uh, than existed in all of history up until two years ago. More data has been created in the last two years than all of history up until then. Two years from now, that will be true again. Two years from then, that will be true again. Data is growing at an ever-exploding rate. With video and IoT, a lot of new data, health, 
uh, wearables, those kinds of things, all of those are creating more data that can make us smarter or it can just make us more distracted. We talk a lot about, we've got all this data, we need big data tools to get our hands around it. Here's what we don't talk about. 50 to 83 percent of the data, sorry, 53 to 80 percent of the data in corporate information systems today is what we call RADI. RADI stands for, it's data that's redundant, outdated, trivial, inaccurate, or incorrect. Now what do you think the biggest offenders for data of that type are? Knowledge management systems, customer relationship management systems, content management systems, those are the ones where we become data hoarders, right? We have all this data in there that's half cobbled together. We don't know which version it is. We don't know how to search for it. In fact, one of the things that uh, Harvard Business Review tells us, and I think I might, someone might have shared this earlier, we spend almost 20% of our time each week searching for the stuff we need to get our jobs done. If you take a thousand person organization and the employees in that organization are making an average of $50,000 per year, that is a $10 million investment you're making into looking for stuff, right? Getting that a little bit clean makes a huge difference. So how are the champions, how are the successful at getting their hands around us? One of the things is they're answering this question. Who really is the steward of our data? What I can tell you this is the, the folks who struggle say, well, that's everybody's job. We're going to put governance rules in place, and it's everybody's job to monitor their own data and keep it up. I'm not saying that doesn't have a place, but what I am saying is when it really is everybody's job, the truth is it's actually nobody's job, right? So it's the chief data officer that we're starting to see the rise of. But it's also this idea of the data steward. Look, if you think of your, of your physical workplace versus your digital workplace, how many of you go into your physical workplace and say, oh, I got to go check the roster because once a week I have to empty all the waste baskets and wash the windows and clean the bathrooms? Is that, really, is that happening anywhere? No, of course not. You've outsourced that, right? You've got building maintenance people and janitorial people and other folks who come and make that job easy for you. Why do we think cleaning our digital workplaces should be any different? What we're seeing more and more of is the successful companies are saying, you know what, yeah, everyone needs to own this a little bit. We need some governance. We can't, we don't want people to make their desktops mess. We, want, we do want people to follow some basic routines for keeping things clean. But why should we make that the responsibility of our people when really our most important asset is the people? The whole idea of our digital workplace is not to automate stuff we already do. It's to unleash the most important assets in our company. And those assets are people. In fact, they're the minds of the people. They're not even the hands of the people, right? It's creativity. It's innovation. It's things that only human beings can do. And if we're instead saying, well, you've got to enter data into 25 different systems every week, and you've got to keep it clean on your own, we're enslaving people to technology instead of the other way around, right? We need to harness technology to unleash our best resources. Data stewards are another way to do it. The third area where the successful do a great job is they create connections. Now, I want to pause and talk about this for just a second. When you think about this idea of connections, a lot of people would tell you yeah, that might be the reason that, what, that we exist as human beings, right? What we all crave is to know and be known, to connect with other people, right? And it's at all sorts of different levels, including in our workplaces. So the best connectors in the world, they're the folks who could walk through a room like this and they'd come out the other end and five of you would think that they're your best friend now, right? They have this natural ability to make that happen. That's not me, I wish it was, but I know people like that and they really are amazing. And when you look at those folks, you think, are they just gifted? But you look and you watch what they do, and they're doing things again and again. They've developed habits, and they fine-tune those habits over time. And in the corporate world, in the business world, there's a word for habit. It's called process. That's what connecting is all about. What we have found for the successful is they figured out there's this intersection, there's this overlap of, yes, people skills matter, but process skills matter just as much. If you get someone with off-the-chart people skills but no process skills, that's a lone ranger. That's somebody that's very hard to control, it's very hard to harness what they're doing. Everyone might like them, but they might not be making much of a contribution. If you take someone with process skills only, they might alienate everybody in the whole organization, beating them up, trying to get them to adopt their process. So there's this intersection of great people skills and great process skills that makes a difference. And it's absolutely something that organizations can, in their digital workplace, start to take more control of. This research from MIT tells a great story. There's a huge impact. The more people that people inside a workplace are created, are, are connected to, whether those are other internal contacts or external contacts, the more revenue they help generate for that organization. There's an absolute correlation between the two of these things. 
Well, you think about your digital workplace and you think about, you know, for the first time ever, I can now observe who people are cr connected to, at least at a digital level. Like, how many documents are they creating and how many people are opening those documents and how many people are, are in their sphere of influence when I look at email and social tools. And by the way, is that trending positive or negative? Is sentiment up or down? Now, I'm not saying you should go and do that wantonly and violate privacy standards, but we're working with organizations that are looking at that data the same way they would look at employee feedback data. They want that to be anonymous, but they can learn a lot from it and they can mitigate potential crises, whether they're crises in integrity or product quality or whatever, by observing that data and doing something with it. They also find small clusters of people who seem to be isolated, right? There's one or two people that are connected to other people in the organization, but most of their connections are within a small group of people. And they've realized that is a big risk factor. We need to find ways to take the disconnected and make them more connected. And you know what? Using digital workplace tools, we can find the disconnected. And we can connect them to people who are the good connectors to help bring them into the culture of the company a little bit more proactively than we used to before. How are processes different in the digital workplace? Classical processes are what I call train tracks, right? They're like railroad tracks. So legacy process is, look, there's one way to do this. It varies very little over time. It doesn't change much, right? Look, when it gets right down to it, creative accounting, not a good term, right? It's good that those processes don't vary much. Product quality. We don't want to get too creative with changing things all the time. We need a lot of control over that. People, relationships, customers, those things need innovation, empowerment, creativity associated with them. People first processes balance this idea of a rigid core with a flexible edge. Some companies are all flexible edge, right? Those are the people who are all lone rangers. It's every man and woman for themselves. There's no road, you're on your horses and you're blazing trails as you go along. Overly rigid, we talked about are the train tracks. The ones who are getting this right are realizing we need enough rigidity to make this an actual process, but we need enough flexibility to be innovative because the future of work, the future of our digital workplaces, it's not about automating things so that people can get stuff from their inbox to their outbox faster. That's what the past, that's what our work legacy was about, making people more efficient. The future of work is about unleashing the unique capability of human beings to do things in work that machines are not going to be able to do anytime soon, if ever. And those things are empowerment, creativity, flexibility, understanding what's going on and being able to apply something to the situation. I work with a, with a client in the nuclear industry arena and they do quality, uh, quality assurance work on nuclear reactors around the country. One area that I kind of thought that has got to be automated to the max and it does have a lot of automation. But I asked, when you look at this, what is the one driving factor that makes a nuclear plant less safe than another nuclear plant? And it was, it is absolutely the human factor. It's, it's when there is a fear culture from the top down, people are afraid to bring up observations. When people aren't saying, if I see something, I need to say something to do something about it, that creates a dangerous situation. No amount of machine monitoring is going to replace that unique human factor we have. If that's true there, how much more true is it of each of your businesses? So when you think about process, you need to think about how do we reinvent how we think about processes? This is one way to reinvent it. This is a journey map. That's not necessarily the way to think about all of your processes, but the people who design processes for legacy business, they're gonna struggle a little bit more to create the processes for the future of work because they're still applying more rigid process design paradigms to what they're doing. So think about process design that embraces flexibility as a part of the process, but also enough rigidity that there's continuous learning. Another word about process. This is a great picture of a city, right? If our digital workplaces were like this physical workplace, one day you'd go into town and there'd be a new building that someone threw up right in the middle of that intersection. And people would be getting run over by cars all the time because no one's following the signals and no one has driver's licenses anywhere. We could go on and on with that example. Tomorrow I'm doing a governance session for the Office 365 Symposium. We'll talk more about this. This is a part of process too. Look, governance is not necessarily, doesn't feel like a good word to a lot of people in the organization. It feels like control. But at the end of the day, governance is how we've made our society a safe place to innovate and grow and learn. And governance is how we're going to make our digital workplaces a safe place to innovate and grow and learn too. We've got to get our hands around governance if we're going to do a good job creating more enabling digital workplaces. The fourth thing that the, that the 
the ones who are the most successful do is they know the results and they always improve them, right? Again, you think about those natural connectors, and they're not just in a steady state. They're constantly learning. They're looking at it one-on-one, -on -one, kind of saying, how did this work with this person? How do I adjust my, my unique relationship with this person to better associate with them over time? And they're looking at it collectively. How is the world receiving me? How am I receiving the world? And how will I fine tune and advance that? And we know people who don't learn from that too. Some people who go a little bit glass half empty, a little bit cynical, and sometimes the world treats them the way they treat the world and they don't understand why, right? The people who are connecting well are constantly evaluating and learning, and businesses are doing that too. When businesses do it, there's three terms that we use for it, and that is they know the score, they share the score, and they give every single employee a voice in improving the score, right? Now, that sounds analytical, and it is, because a lot of companies really struggle to know the score. Most of them know the big score, the score on the big scoreboard, right? Maybe that's EBITDA or customer satisfaction or something like that. But most of them will tell you, most managers will tell you, I do not know the metrics I need to know to understand the performance of the people in my group. And that means the people in that group say, I don't really know how I'm contributing to this big picture score. I'm kind of taking it on faith. I'm flying blind. But there's absolutely ways to do that, right? But the hardest part is the collaboration part. It's giving everybody a voice and improving that score. So we actually call this the collaboration principle because this is a tough part, right? And it's something that we here, we can speak to a little bit. We know the digital workplace gives us better tools for doing that. We're just not sure if we're employing them the right way to make that happen. Here's what we found when we looked a little bit closer at this idea of collaboration. When you talk to business leaders, according to the authors of Boundary Spanning Leadership, 86% of those leaders said collaboration is critical to the success of my group. I think the other 14% went out of business. Then they said, those same leaders, so how good are you at it? 7% said we're good at it. A whopping 79% gap. So how do we get good at collaboration? How do we give everybody a voice? A couple of quick things on that. First of all, we need to understand what are we giving people a voice for, right? Giving people a voice is this whole idea of we want them engaged. How do we get them engaged? We are in the business, every one of us, of creating great experiences for our customers. That is what we want to give our employees a voice around. How do we work together better to create this better customer experience? You might have heard of BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals. John F. Kennedy was famous for one of the first ones. Put a man on the moon and bring him back home safely by the end of this decade. Everyone thought, oh, we can't do it, it's too big. And yet they rose up and did it. We also just learned that we have the attention span of, in fact, we aspire to the attention span of a goldfish, right? So BHAGs don't work very well in our society anymore these days. So we've started calling the goals that we see working from the champions SQUAGs, small, quickly attainable goals. I don't have too much time to describe it, but let me give you a simple example that I can relate to, probably all of us can feel a little bit. BHAG for Jeff Abels, lose 30 pounds, right? I'd like to lose 30 pounds, but you know what? I can't do that tomorrow and my focus is gonna be gone a week from now. Squag for Jeff Abels, raise your heart rate 25 minutes every day. I have 100% control over making that squag happen. Those are the kind of goals that people know how to respond to. Some people call them KPIs, but that term has become diluted. So we created the term squags to describe what the champions are doing. Love to talk to you more about that. We also have to create fail-safe cultures, place where, places where it's safe to talk about failure. We call them lion's den experiences because when we see people doing them well, it feels like the lion's den, right? If you're familiar with the story of the lion's den, it's, I don't want to go into the lion's den. I could be killed by the lion, but I know something bigger has got my back. I know I'm, a, I'm, I'm part of something that cares for me and is going to take care of it. So although it's dangerous, it's also safe. And I, I buy into it because it's a safe place to do that. A lion's den experience, great bomber story. I'll be glad to tell you separately about that too, about World War II um, separately. So four things out of the five we've talked about. Listen, understand, connect, and know. Here's a simple way to remember those. Luck, listen, understand, connect, and know. When we looked at companies doing that well, we said those companies are powered by luck. And some of them were already doing it. I wish we kind of went and invented luck, but it's really just what we observed and we kind of named it something. But the successful have been doing this for many years, long, by the way, before they were necessarily a digital company. But when they embraced digital and they applied this to it, it worked well. Now, we've still found that some companies seem to embrace this concept, but they didn't seem to really get traction with it as quickly as others. We spent a lot of time asking why, and ultimately the reason why was because uh, luck is what you do. It is not who you are. And when it is who companies are, 
that makes all the difference in the world, right? That's a hard distinction to make, and I'm a numbers guy, so we call that good luck, by the way. So good luck is who you are. You're applying luck for the sake of good because you're really about something bigger than just serving customers, than just selling stuff, than just making a profit. So we did some research and found some numbers, and lo and behold, integrity and mission and purpose and culture, they all count, and they count in a huge way. And when you're missing these things or you're just paying lip service to these things and not actually doing them, it absolutely makes a huge negative difference in your organization. Now, people respond to this and say, that's great, Jeff, but I'm not the CEO. I can't make a difference. What I can tell you is absolutely, from all the evidence I've seen, is you can. Change always starts with you. It always starts with a person. And I have worked with people very low on the totem pole who have said, it's a dark place. Part of my mission is to bring a little bit of light into the darkness. And they've been able to gradually turn a company around. It absolutely can happen. You can't make it happen tomorrow. It takes patience, but it can happen. The other thing it takes is looking at this and saying, we need our leaders to be digital leaders. Our leaders and managers, don't, they don't just buy technology and tell us to use it. That's what leads to failure. That's the easy button. It's that they are actually embracing and learning how to use this technology to run their teams and to run the business better than ever before. This, these statistics speak to companies that actually have digitally advanced leaders and managers versus those that don't. There's absolutely a difference. How do you create that? If you're not the leader, how do you create it? What we're seeing is organizations that get there ultimately embrace this idea of saying, our leaders need leaders. We need coaches. And they're starting to adopt titles, whether those are internal titles or whether those are people they've even outsourced and have partners doing these for them, helping coach them along. But things like a digital advisor, a customer experience manager, a chief people officer, those kinds of things. Things where people are saying, we're taking the people side of digital very, very seriously, and we need someone to get our executives to stop asking their assistants to print out their emails so that they can respond to them. That is still a thing, and it happens sometimes, but there's a more advanced digital concept around that too. How many of your executives can say, I've met and know people pretty at a pretty intimate level, if you will, obviously a you know, neutral intimate level, but that I've never met? all through social channels internally because I'm creating relationships at a much broader and deeper level than I can using these digital tools that I couldn't do before. So if there's one slide you're gonna take a, you wanna take a picture of to take back with you, it's this recap. Listen, understand, connect, know. If you look at your digital workplace, if you, if you look at your knowledge management initiative and you say, how are we doing the, each of these four things better, it will absolutely become better and better than it has been before. We backed up again and again and looked at this and thought, does it apply to this? Does it apply to that? And every time we reapply it, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get your head around the abstract concept and apply it to what you're doing. It absolutely makes a difference. And is it all supported by a foundation that's closing the cultural gap? Because all of us have a cultural gap, right? That's a whole idea of cultural values. It's this vision of who we want to be, but we're, we all fail at that, right? So how can digital help us to minimize those failures and to close that cultural gap a little bit? That's powered by luck. I love speaking to you guys because I think it's a great time to be alive and in people-centric workplaces because everything is changing. When we look at where we are, we stand on the shoulders of giants. You guys may not realize this, but you are the giant shoulders that the next generation is going to be standing on. So thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I'll be doing a book signing. Uh, there's a few resources up here. Feel free to pin me down if you want them. And I'll be doing a book signing right down the hall here immediately after this. And we've got a free, few freebies there too. So feel free to stop by and grab one. Even if you don't get a book, I'll give you some of the freebies. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Jeff. And Jeff's book is in the uh, bookstore as well. And I'm going to encourage him to go there at lunchtime. Uh, we have a 15-minute break right now. We'll resume at uh, 11.45 with industry insights from three speakers. Thank you, see you there.